Do you ever say something really stupid and then it becomes like a teachable moment? Uh, like you say something dumb and then your parents or boss or whoever takes that moment as an opportunity to not only scold you, but <laughs> to uh, have it as a teachable moment for everyone else around. That's what we're gonna look at here today. So open up your Bible to, to Luke 15 and we'll take a look at it. In Luke chapter 15, verse one, we step into a setting where it says this. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, and the idea here is of a continuous grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Uh, what happens right here is the people who are of the upper crust of society, the people who seem, uh, who are used to people catering to them, to calling them rabbi, to, to giving them preferred seats, are being, as they would view it, snubbed. Uh, so how are they going to respond to that? You know, it's one thing if, if you start out poor and then your standard of living elevates. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to have an elevated standard of living and then to have to come back down, right? And now you got to do all the work yourself and now you're poor again. And it's hard to readjust to that. The same thing is true with our pride in this kind of way. I mean, I can sympathize a little bit with a Pharisee here or a scribe. You think you're a big deal. You've come to imagine yourself as someone that people go to for wisdom and insight for the word of God. And now this man comes who is able to do impossible things, incredible things, and he's teaching with authority and, and other such things. And they've made this accusation against him before, by the way, back in chapter five. They didn't like his answer. And so now we, we come back to it. And what's, what are they going to do? Well, their response is to double down on that and to grumble and complain. This would be awkward at best for them. What are you supposed to say when the people that you consider to be the low rung of society, the people you have determined are not valuable, um, someone else comes along and says, no, these are the valuable people in society. What are you going to do about that? Are you just going to adjust and change? There's a wonderful thing that Jesus extends. Not only is he extending his kindness and grace to come and seek and save the lost, but he, in doing so, he is willing to continue to exercise patience and rebuke for those who, uh, well, they don't deserve it, but for those who are normally unwilling to listen. One, one thing that's often true is that maybe you won't listen to a rebuke for a direct rebuke from somebody, but you might listen to a story. And Jesus uses a series of three stories here, but we're just going to look at the one, to try and rebuke the Pharisees for their way of viewing, their way of thinking about those that, they are, that are clearly lost sheep. So that's where we are. You come to the end of, of their complaint, and it's he receives sinners, and he eats with them. He doesn't just let them come to him. He also sits there and eats with them. So Jesus pivots in verse 3, and it says he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, which was like, this isn't a huge flock. This is a mid-sized range in this time of, of sheep to have. A large fold of sheep was considered to be 300. So this isn't somebody of fabulous wealth, and this isn't somebody who's super poor. There's somebody in between. Which man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Which of you, when you find yourself in a scenario like this, and they, this would have been normal understanding to them, even if they didn't have sheep themselves, uh, even if they only had a few or, or whatever, they certainly knew someone who did. This is an agrarian society. This is, uh, this is common discussion. This would be like talking about an oil change for your car. 
you know, well, that illustration doesn't fit, but you get my point. It's just that common. Which of you, if you've got a hundred sheep, if you lose one, so usually what's happening is at the end of the night, you're bringing all the sheep in and uh, you start counting them off. Or you have some situation where you need to count them off because you just had some kind of interaction and so you need to do a head count. Uh, we, my wife and I, have four children. And uh, that's not that many. But when we leave, when we leave certain locations, if it's been kind of chaotic, you've got to do a head count. And that's only, you know, there's only six of us. But you still do the head count. So this is a normal practice. If you have a hundred sheep, you know, if you have a fold of sheep, you're going to count them and make sure you've got everyone accounted for. And if you lost one, which of you wouldn't go look for the one that's lost? Well, I can tell you who wouldn't go look for the one that's lost. A heartless jerk of a person. Someone who doesn't care, like a hired hand, rather than an owner. Here what we have an imagery of is an owner of these sheep. And so there's a natural concern. Any good guy, any good shepherd, is going to be concerned about the one that's lost. The implications are already there, built into the, the story, but he continues. And notice, as he continues, the, the emotional response that comes from this good shepherd. Uh, he will search for this one that's lost until he finds it, which might be through the night. Uh, if he doesn't find the sheep itself, he's certainly going to be looking for the evidence of it. Like if, a, if an animal got a hold of it and tore it apart, you're going to try to, you know, follow the trail and, and make sure established that the animal isn't still alive out there. But here we have a, a much happier story. It says, and when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. So I imagine a guy out there who's lost a sheep, and uh, when he finds it, he, you know, he's, he's rejoicing, he's happy, and he picks up that sheep, puts it on his shoulders, holds the legs together, and he starts walking home with a smile on his face. But in my head, I don't know why, I typically have pictured a very small lamb. But it says a sheep. And a full-grown sheep isn't that light. Why would he have uh, picked up this, this sheep rather than just kind of scooting it on home? Well, most likely the, the idea conveyed would be this is an animal that has been stressed out, uh, as any sheep is when it gets completely removed from its flock. It would be stressed out and fearful and probably exhausted and worn out from the situation that it's gotten itself into. And so in helping this, little, uh, this sheep recover from the situation, this is a shepherd who is uh, glad to help. He goes further. So we're getting a picture uh, into the heart of Christ and his care and concern for those who are lost. The response of the Pharisees is to see him, is to see Jesus mingling among and drawing to himself unmentionables, undesirables, deplorables. And to see that and go, ugh. To insult Jesus and these people that are coming. Notice that they say without fear. This idea that they're sinners. They, they have no hesitation. They're not censoring themselves. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody just openly insult you like that not, while not looking directly at you. They're just talking about you like you're not in the room and they're insulting you. That's what's happening. That's how they view the lost as opposed to God. Verse 6. And when this man comes home after finding the sheep, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I've found my sheep that was lost. Beautiful picture. Everybody loves a redemption story. Everybody loves that the animals found. I mean, this is most likely the animals would be dead if it's gone out through the night. And uh, if it's been out for any dura serious duration of time, most likely you're not going to recover it intact. Uh, it's going to be torn apart by some animal or drowned in some water or, f or fall off a cliff or any number of things. And instead, we have a very happy ending. 
He's elated. He's so happy. He calls his friends and says, you know, come rejoice with me. This would certainly resonate with any audience of the time. They could understand it. They can picture it. it it's vivid. It's a great story. And then Jesus drives home his point just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. I don't think the 99 were actually righteous. I think the 99 were very self-righteous. How do I know that? We don't see any sense of rejoicing. If you're on Jesus' team, what is the proper response to a lost person coming home? Joy. Elation. Being thrilled over the, the opportunity even to be a part of that. The Pharisees are having it rubbed in their face that they're not actually good shepherds. They imagine themselves to be the saviors of the people. But instead what they've done, is they, they've decided we just stay with our own and with the moral kind of people. We don't even associate with these people that you're talking to. We don't have anything to do with them because they will defile us in the process. Uh, they've taken some general basic principles of, of the Old Testament and they've taken them too far to where they have no heart for those that are lost. Like I said, what shepherd wouldn't go out and look? A bad shepherd. What shepherd doesn't want to rescue I, I, just a cold-hearted person? Who doesn't care? Well, that's exactly the position that the Pharisees have found themselves in. And by the grace of God, this story would have connected in some minds. Because we learn later as we go through the New Testament, especially Acts, we learn that various Pharisees come to Christ. They, they seek salvation in Christ alone. So these stories have a way of breaking through things, and through minds and through consciences that, that have become so hardened up. I don't know how you look at uh, people who are not on your team currently. I don't know how you look at people that are on the opposite side of the political aisle from you or any number of issues. But my friend, do you view them as lost? Do you pray that Christ will draw them to himself? And are you willing to be one who would go out and seek to save them, to share the gospel, to shine the light of God's truth? If not, if we don't have a heart like that, what does that say about us? I think we know what it says about us. So I'd love to, to leave just on a super happy note, but sometimes the note isn't happy. Sometimes the key hits wrong and it stays in your mind. And maybe that'll do that to you this time. Maybe as you look at this story, you can see a bit of yourself in the Pharisees. And you can feel a bit of that condemnation. Or you can just be thrilled that Christ is using you at all to reach out to the lost. And be grateful all over again that heaven rejoices at one sinner coming home. You were that sinner. Christ did an amazing thing to save you from your sins. Rejoice in that. Have a party like this man did here. I'll see you next time.